replacing a nine-year incumbent from Mount Horeb. She has been re-elected ever since and has served her entire term on the Assembly Education Committee, most often as ranking member or chair. She is the Assembly's leading voice advocating for public education and always calling for adequate resources and a stronger investment in children. She has served on numerous other committees, but her focus has been on public education. She is here with us today to help explain the complicated and complex nature of education as our community's public schools have come under attack from those wanting to make money off of the backs of school children. Vouchers, charters, virtual schools, what are they and should we be worried? Thank you for coming, Summer. playground voice and a library voice, so if I fall into my library voice, let me know. We have a microphone here and we'll rectify that. Um, for those of you on this side of the room, I'm going to be using this chalkboard. I hope you can see it. Okay, good. And um, just to let you know that what's going on in education today is in flux. It, uh, there's so much happening, so many changes with the budget. Uh, the omnibus bill has me just really really worried about teacher licensure but i'm not here tonight to talk to you about what's happening right now because it'll all be different next week i'm pretty sure <laughs> but when we talk about voucher schools and charter schools and that sort of thing people immediately get lost because they don't understand them they don't know are they private are they public what are they who goes to them so tonight we're going to try to figure that out in some real meaningful sort of way so Personally, I went to a London country school for four years. I sat in a Laura Ingalls Wilder desk that had a little hole in it, and the seat folded up and went down. Um, we had a red wing crop at the back of the room, which was only filled if we went out and pumped the water and brought it in. And the bathrooms were two little buildings down the hill. And seriously, that's where I went for four years. It was fabulous. And then consolidation happened, and I ended up in the city school in Arena. <laughs> Which, if you've been to Arena, <laughs> you know it's not so much of a city. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'm, I'm just wanting to find out sort of the makeup of the room. How many of you went to a Wonder Country school? Okay, not alone. Um, how many of you went to a private parochial school? Any kind of a public school, high school, middle school, okay. Anybody homeschool? Is anybody homeschooling? You did a few decades ago. You did? Okay. So essentially, our understanding of school, for the most part, has been just that. We, we all know about the public schools. So there's only a couple kinds of schools to be talked about. And it should fit in one of these three categories. There's our public school. Over here is our private school. And you know what? We're going to stick homeschool down here because it's kind of a lonely little beast that we don't know very much about, but there they are. Okay. So essentially, kids in Wisconsin go to one of those three kinds of schools. But we've, we've changed things a bit. Um, the Constitution of Wisconsin designates an entity to oversee public school. And that is the Department of Public Instruction. And their job is to just make, uh, I can't think of them right at the same time. Tony Evers is the superintendent. Statewide election, so he has powers that cannot be taken away by the legislature. He's elected by the people, and his duty is his duty and not ours. So already we're finding that we've got some struggles about who's telling him what to do, who wants to have his powers, 
and how they're going about getting it. In Wisconsin, we have 2,218 public schools in 424 districts. And because of the geography of our state, my belief is it's pretty much going to stay that way and needs to stay that way because it's so difficult to put kids on a bus, send them off to another school district or another building for the sake of putting them together and having, um, well, more efficiency, let's say, in teaching. I personally rode more than an hour each way to school sometimes when I went to school, um, from Arena to Spring Green. It wasn't a direct route. We went up the hills and around the valleys. And that can be dangerous and risky in the wintertime. So it's not good just to say, okay, we're going to consolidate and bring these kids together. It just doesn't work always because of our um, geography. Right now we have 875,000 kids in public school. Almost a million almost a million kids in our public schools. And the thing that I keep reminding folks, if you pick up the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin, it directs the legislature to do one thing and one thing only. Anything else we do, it's because we want to. We choose to. And that is to provide the free and equal educational opportunity for every student in Wisconsin. And that includes all students who have disabilities, all students who may or may not speak English, if they are between the ages of 6 and 20, we are supposed to be educating them. Compulsory to age 16, but we have to educate them if they have not graduated and stick around through age 20. Um, we're kind of unique in that too sometimes. On average, we will spend about $10,000 to educate that student. Now, there are different kinds of places that they go um, with different kinds of um, local tax support behind them, but that's just on average. I've always enjoyed the fact <clears throat> that having been a member of the Corrections Committee, in fact, I was ranking member one year, in Wisconsin right now, we are spending on average $33,000 a year to house a prisoner. And that's just behind the bars and bad guys. And I've been to almost every prison in Wisconsin. They're not nice places. Um, they aren't watching TV and lounging, I will tell you that for sure. But $33,000 for that guy. We're spending over $100,000 a year for juveniles. Add to that probation and parole costs. Prison Corrections is expensive. Here's the thing that drives me nuts. 70% of the prisoners, the incarcerated, in our state do not have a high school diploma. I'm no rocket scientist, but it just seems that we've, we've got too much money on one end of this and not enough on the other. And I don't know how many times I get Republicans saying, so what do you want to do, just throw money at the problem? No, I don't want to throw money at the problem, but I want more money to deal with the problem. And if educating our students is not our number one priority, then what is our hope for the economy of Wisconsin? How are we ever going to be a leader in this country, in this planet, globally, if we don't educate our citizens? So this is where I get into trouble fighting for public education. It's um, an ongoing battle. So 83% of the kids in Wisconsin go to public school. 12% of the kids in Wisconsin go to private school. So we're still missing some, but we'll find them. <laughs> in a public school situation, anybody ever serve on school board? school comes an elected school board. Anybody want to talk about some of the duties that the school board has? Hire a superintendent. Hire the superintendent. Decide the curriculum, right? Determine the budget or 
Pass the budget. Pass the budget. Yep. School boards are there for a reason. If my child is expelled, and I think it's because the teacher was bad and my kid was innocent, where do I go? To the school board. It's the kind, it's, it's the stopgap between you, the parent, or the student, and the powers that be. And they are elected. So if you don't like the curriculum, if there's things happening in your school that you are unhappy about, you've got a school board to go to. And um, hopefully that locally elected school board cares about you and your issues and will respond to you. So underneath the school board, that's the thing that you, you guys and I all talked about, and that's the traditional public school. So we're still in familiar territory, are we not? Nothing unusual in here. Well, it so happened in 1993 that somebody decided we should have charter schools in Wisconsin. Well, how are we going to run charter schools? Who's going to run the charter school? Why do we need them? Initially, I think we can look to Milwaukee as being the impetus for a lot of reform in education in Wisconsin. Um, I'm sure you know now that we are probably the most segregated school district in the country in Milwaukee and terribly, terribly unsuccessful when it comes to educating our minority, especially young men. So in order to deal with that, somebody said, well, let's, let's create charter schools. And, and they can operate differently than public schools without all of the mandates and the red tape and the rigmarole. Let's, let's give that a try. So we still needed to figure out how to do that. So we're going we're to stick a charter school in here. And they were called instrumentality charter schools. And this is where things start getting messy. An instrumentality charter school still responds to the school board. I, I don't know if Mount Ford even has them. Do you have any charter schools in Mount Ford? No. Okay. Verona has several. Core Knowledge. Um, they are schools within schools. They still answer to the school board. The staff is still hired by the school board. Um, if things don't work out, their charter, and, and the word charter really is a, a contract, a five-year agreement between the people who decide they are willing to take on the responsibility of running this charter school. Um, if things aren't going well, the charter gets pulled, it's all over their back into the regular classroom. So um, the first two charter schools in Wisconsin, one was in Verona, one was in Middleton, and they were for at-risk high school students generally. Uh, these kids were not going to graduate from high school, oftentimes because of drug issues, alcohol, um, many times because they were way, way, way too smart. School was boring and they spent their time figuring out ways to kind of disrupt the day and entertain themselves. So that's where the at-risk charter schools began and that was a good idea. Shabazz in Madison, you've heard of it? That's another one. So, you know, it seemed like this is a good idea. We still got our school board, and we still got the Department of Public Instruction running things, telling, letting us know how, uh, how, what things they they still have to do when they graduate. They still have to earn the same kinds of credits as a regular school, but they can operate more freely. And when I think of charter schools, at least for the at-risk students, I see sofas, and I see that the chairs and desks are gone. And, and the kids are in a much more comfortable setting, a lot more freedoms, and um, it, it kind of worked for them. Um, okay, so instrumentality charter schools. Right now we have almost 30,000 students in those charter schools. And we often just call them charters because that's kind of the original first charter school was this, and so when people talk about charter schools, they're talking about the instrumentality charter school that is run by the school board. And then along comes 
virtual charter schools. Because we didn't provide enough funds for schools to operate, schools were looking for ways to make money. Scoreboards. Remember the Pepsi boards? They would give you money to put up their scoreboards. Um, people were finding ways to buy space in schools. Uh, the Pizza Hut Book It Club. Remember those? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Pizza Hut wanted to have their brand in the school because kids become brand loyal very, very early. If you can buy your way into their little hearts and minds at an early stage, you probably have a customer for life. Um, how many of you know people who will only drink Pepsi or only drink Coke? That kind of brand loyalty means a lot to corporate America. So they found their way into schools. Um, but anyway, so school districts are looking for money. And somebody said, you know, what if, what if we put school online? So kids never had to leave home. They could take all of their education through the computer. They would never come to our bricks and mortar building. We wouldn't have to transport them. We wouldn't have to feed them. No electricity, no lights, no teachers, no, no custodials, no equipment. This might not be a bad idea. So the first virtual charter schools came about in Appleton. I happened to know the superintendent, Tom Scallon, at the time. And I thought, what is this? How, do you, how does a kindergartner have a <laughs> kindergarten class on a computer? Really? Um, it just seemed a little too wacky to me. So I got my car and went up to Appleton. Tom had 10 virtual schools going at that time. One was all about Shakespeare. One was a project school where the kids never came to a classroom, but they once in a while would come to, they actually used a storefront in a little shopping mall. They would come in and they would get their tag board and their markers and they were, they were learning by doing projects. And they would go home and they might not check back for weeks. But that was sort of directed by parents. Parents were agreed to supervise. This was going to be their responsibility. And kids were going to learn online. Well, for a lot of us, that just sounded weird, very weird. They had one that was focusing on cooking using whole grains and, and vegetables. And they ran a kitchen. And certain kids found this to be great, but that's where they got their math. That's where they got their science. Um, they had an engineering group. They had an arts group. It was pretty interesting. Tom is no longer living, but when I talked to him about it, he said, you know what, Sonny? We're making money hand over fist here. Because the state pays the tuition for each one of those kids, and I'm only committing two teachers in a room much, much smaller than this, who were overseeing all of this activity on computers. Kids had assignments. They were supposed to return them. The teachers checked them. Um, and I thought, wow, I, I actually thought this. It, it didn't appeal to me, but he said, I'll tell you what, I would not let my grandchildren do this. <laughs> because what's left in the classroom after you pull out the kids who are interested in these 10 charter opportunities is a pretty homogenized group of kids. And he said, I want my, I want my grandchildren to know about what it's like to operate out in the world with real people who are different and have different ideas and share different experiences. So anyway, that's how that went. And I got to thinking about it and I thought, you know, if I had a kid with really big behavioral problems that we couldn't manage at school, you know, I know kids who would run away out the back door the minute the parents dropped them off the front door. Um, Maybe a kid who had an illness, migraine headaches, and just could not get to school on that 8 to 3 schedule. Maybe this would work. I don't know. But they were making it work, but more importantly, they were making money. Lots of money. Um, so that's one of the first places that we discovered that you can make money in education. One of the biggest charter operators right now in the state is McFarland. 
they actually have more kids in their virtual school than they do in their physical school. Yeah. Um, Northern Ozaki, and this was back then back in like 2005 or six, had 805 kids in their virtual school, eight of whom actually lived in the Northern Ozaki School District. But they were making lots of money, and they needed it. I, I, I can't blame them. If we would have been funding adequately, this beast would probably never have um, shown up. So each kid going to one of these virtual schools, I didn't put virtual down here yet, did I? Okay. Each kid going to a virtual school right now is collecting $6,635. And for that, you got a couple of teachers in a room, a lot of computers. They get a computer. Each kid gets a computer. But all of their instruction is done from home. It takes a commitment on the part of the parents. So the one thing that ties all of these together, a public school, all of these are tied together by money, taxpayer money. I wish the green would show up better because green represents the money. Taxpayer dollars. Public schools are directly tied to the Department of Public Instruction. So then that all worked out pretty well, sort of. And somebody said, you know, we can expand this idea. They don't really have to be accountable to a school board. Let's create a chartering agency. Huh? So, who do we want to be the chartering agencies who can create and operate charter schools? We have four of them in Wisconsin. UW-Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee Area Technical College, and UW Parkside. Uh, UW Parkside has been bothered in the model there in the last year. But what does the city know about running the school? Not a whole lot. I don't know. Maybe a university. But you've lost something in this process here. If I've got a kid who's going to a charter school, by the way, there are how many of these? 12, 30, 20, about 30 charter schools who are governed and owned and operate under these charter agencies. But they're missing this piece. There's no connection here. So if I've got a student who goes to one of these charter schools, and that child is expelled, or I don't like the curriculum, my option is one, drop out and go back to public school, or two, where's the school board that you hold accountable for the success of this? I don't think I'm going to get in the car and go to the common council meeting in the city of Milwaukee to talk about my students' expulsion problem. So we lost control. When that happened, we lost control. However, what we didn't lose was the public dollar. Your money is still buying all of this. So tax dollars, no accountability, because there's nobody at UW Parkside or the Tech College or UW Milwaukee who is elected and under the purview of the Department of Public Instruction. So now our public school system has started to fall apart on us. We don't really have control over it anymore. So who establishes the curriculum for the schools under the charter agents? Well, I'm assuming that, you know, I, I, I can't honestly tell you that I know for sure, but UW-Milwaukee obviously has some group that wants to work the school and, and does it. Um, 
There are different, there's 12 of them, so I'm not real sure. I've not visited them. I couldn't tell you. But it's interesting. It's a, it's a thoughtful question, isn't it? But <coughs> these kids still have to pass the same graduation test requirements. So whatever they're doing, it's probably okay. I don't know. Um, then we came upon another idea. We have another kind of charter school now. They're called 2R charters. And the only reason they're called 2R charters is because that's part of the statutory language that they fall under, 2R charters. They're also called non-instrumentality because they don't have the, the um, charter that these do. Uh, we have different names for them. 4% of our kids go to this kind of a school. And I have visited some of them. They are, they're there supposedly to bring the opportunity for innovation, new ideas, things that just wouldn't work in a public school that teachers are willing to do. Um, they're also sold as an idea to create competition for public schools where if they do tremendously better than public school, you know, we can share best practices, yada, yada, yada. Um, have they privately helped? Have they helped? Have they privately helped? Nope, not yet. Can you give us an idea of what types of things they do that they say is better? Well, I have been to several of them in Milwaukee. Um, maybe they don't do art, maybe they don't do music, maybe they don't do this and Maybe they concentrate really on the core subject matters. Maybe they spend a lot of time with remediation. A couple that I have been to have really taken on some very, very challenging students. Um, they've got their own rules that you couldn't get by with in a public school. Yeah. Um, okay. So guess how much money you pay to have these kids go to school? $8,075 per kid. And that money comes off the top of the pot. When we have a pot of money for public education, they've managed to get it arranged now, so their $8,075 is guaranteed, comes first. What's left is going to be divvied up with the public school kids in whatever the formula works for them. Okay, let's look at privates for a minute. 93,000 kids go to private school, almost 100,000 of them. Private school, as almost all of us knew them years ago, was usually parochial, correct? Some not, but almost all of them were. Many of them Catholic. Lots of little towns had their private school. Usually they went K-8, not high school. Yeah. So that's kind of generally the private school experience. Uh, so they are private paid. Right now we have 859 private schools in Wisconsin. All is well. They are not connected to Department of Public Instruction. We cannot tell you their truancy rate. We cannot tell you their graduation rate. We cannot tell you anything about them, how many days they go to school. We make public school kids go 180 days a year. In private school, we have no control over that. So it's kind of like homeschooling in that, as a parent, it's up to you to decide what they're telling me about the school that they're doing is satisfactory to me, and I want that. Most often, most often, it includes a religious component to the education. And that's why, up until not too many years ago, public schools and private schools never intermingled with money. Your tax dollar never pays for a private school until a few years ago. That's changed a bit. So, there's your traditional private schools. Any of them around here that you know of? In the village of Cross Plains. Yep. 
My grandchildren go to that school. My husband's children. <laughs> okay. So, okay, now we get to looking at the private school and back in Milwaukee, thank you Tommy Thompson, an experiment is suggested. And that is, let's take those kids who are in the worst of the worst public schools in Milwaukee. Which, by the way, do you know what the biggest factor is that makes a school, quote, a failure? Crime and poverty of the neighborhood. <clears throat> yeah, that's truly the biggest reason. And yet, that fact does not settle into the brains of those people who keep wanting to change public school. I've always said, you cannot teach the child you wish you had in class. You have to teach the child you have in class. And if they come from poverty, if they come from a neighborhood ridden with crime, what are you to do about it as a teacher? How does the school board fix that problem? And yet, there are those who want to hold teachers accountable for the performance of students who live in those situations. And it isn't just Milwaukee. We have poverty all over Wisconsin, and a lot of it is in the rural communities. A lot of poverty. So, rather than say, you know, as a state, maybe our bigger job is to provide food security, make sure kids are getting health care, make sure that they actually go to a home to do their homework instead of a car, if they're lucky, or a shelter. But we don't do that. We just hold teachers accountable for the performance of teachers in those most, um, most difficult places to teach. Okay, um, so somebody says, you know, th there's got to be a way to use private schools and give them taxpayer dollars to educate kids. And this is, this is where I really get into a lot of anger about all of this. Education in this country is a $600 billion industry. And I, I really feel like there is this group of people. I mean, somebody tell me why Amway cares about the students in Wisconsin. I, I haven't figured that out yet. There's, there's something here. The, the Walmart family, what do they care? But converting classrooms into profit-making centers. That's what's happening to education, not only in Wisconsin, but in this whole country. And then they call it reform. And it's hard to argue. You know, when, when you look at the abysmal failure of some of the schools in Milwaukee, it's hard to defend what's happening there. But more money for teachers who are willing to go there and teach better buildings, more time for remediation, for mentors. There's all kinds of things that we can do, but we don't do. But we could make money off of this if we could just get these public dollars over here into these private schools. And we call those voucher schools. So now we've got another new beast, and it's the voucher school. And that's the big, growing, ugly one, voucher school. A voucher school runs, for the most part, and this has changed a lot over the last 10 years because we, Democrats, have been fighting tooth and nail to make that change. But voucher schools run like a private school in that this entity, Superintendent Evers, has darn little to say about what's going on here. So over the years, we have made some headway where we were able, able to bring some modicum of change so that we, we can assure ourselves that what's going on in the voucher schools where there is some accountability. Right now, they have to take the same standardized tests that our kids do, sort of. Um, they don't have to do art. They don't have to do music. 
They don't have to provide school counselors. They don't have to have libraries. Um, only recently did their teachers have to have at least a bachelor's degree. Mm. A few years ago, you could teach in a voucher school without as much as a bachelor's degree, much less a teaching degree. But these are some of the things that we have been fighting for and managed to, to make changes. So I'm going to give you, have you pass out or hand out these. I meant to do it earlier and didn't think of it. It is a test, I, is it? Uh, it's a test, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. No recess. <laughs>
Uh, today, students in the voucher schools have to take the standard tests. They have to meet the graduation rates, and the school has to give us an accountability report in terms of the finances. I can't tell you the number of horrors, horror stories we have heard about voucher schools in Milwaukee. I'm sure you've read in the paper yourself. Bought a Mercedes, kids didn't have desks, kids didn't have books. By the time we caught up with them, they were heading to Florida where they opened the new voucher school. Happened all the time. Pardon? Oh, oh. Baltimore hired. Oh, yes. They, they actually privatized the entire school system. So did New Orleans. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah. uh, scores get plummeting, and I believe the CEO of that firm that retired with, with several months of Yeah. It's, it's amazing what, what they get by with other time. Yes, you catch up with them. Question. Mm -hmm. how, and you maybe are planning on going to do this later, if so fine. But how did they justify the lack of separation of church and state? The Supreme Court said it was okay. There was a Supreme Court challenge. And, and where do you think we get today with this Supreme Court? Oh. Yeah. 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 I have talked to numerous, we had numerous meetings with superintendents collectively. And went back when WEAC was alive and well, they thought about it. But with this particular Supreme Court, we know we lose. And there's no way that they have to be justified as to, well, this is the reason that, that it's okay, it's just to say so. Right, right. The only, the, the only thing that could happen would be legislative. Give us a couple decades. <laughs> yeah, a couple of decades. 86 percent of the kids in um, voucher schools right now were already there as private pay students. So this is an entitlement to the already wealthy. Um, the eligibility to be in a voucher school depends that we have several voucher programs. We've got the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, we have one in Racine, and we have this big statewide piece. Um, that the Republicans just now decided to give $48 million to in order to expand this statewide. Um, so it's an entitlement to people who are already doing it. The eligibility rate at 300% of federal poverty is 71,000 something for a family of four. If the couple is married, it's $77,000. That's not, to me, the state needs to come in and help you pay for your private education, but we're doing it. And among other things, once you're eligible, so let's say my husband and I, with our two kids, want our kids in private college school, we want you to pay for it, thank you very much. So I quit my job. Now we have one income, we become eligible, I go get my job back, we are eligible for life for any number of children that we have in our family. Once you establish it at the federal poverty level rate of 300 percent, you're good to go. Aren't these doctor schools a lot of cherry pick Oh, good. They will tell you no. They will tell you no. That they have to take everybody. They have 2 percent um, special ed students compared to Milwaukee's 23 percent. So. If they haven't cherry picked, they've really spun the wheel and gotten very lucky. The one thing that they can do is expel students. And again, there's no school board to go and whine to. So they get this kid in, they take a special ed kid who's not doing well on tests, they find a reason to expel them, behavior problems, disruption, blah, 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 blah. They send them back to the public school. By the way, they get to keep the money That's for quite a little chunk of time before they send the money back. Um, make sure they get them out before the third, third, well, third, third, Friday. third Friday count. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a terrible scheme that's going on, and the taxpayer is funding it, and we just don't have much control over it. Hi, Jean, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Two questions. Uh, 
Do foods and voucher schools uh, play by the same set of rules or not? <coughs> they have to pass the constitution test to graduate? I guess so. We'll see. Okay. And then, is there anything going on in this movement towards students from voucher schools participating on athletic teams in the public school? If they live in the same geographical area? I'm going to fight that one, but it won't do me any good. But I'm going to fight it. If the Republicans want it to happen, it will happen. Right now, if you aren't aware of what he's talking about, there is this movement saying kids in the private schools ought to be able to go and become part of the team in the public school because, after all, their parents are paying taxes. And it's a tough argument to make, but mine is, if you've chosen to put your child in a private school, stay there. Because what they're going to do is bump out kids in the public school, their space, their place. They're going to take advantage of the gymnasium and the stage and all the weight equipment, not have to pay for it, but have access to it. They won't have to pay for the coaches, because you're going to do that in your public school. It's not a good deal, but it's going to be a tough argument. Yes? I think it goes the other way. I think the private schools cherry-pick the athletes for their program. Look at the private schools and look at the divisions that they always win. Division two is almost always won by a parochial school team. And it will be in the confusion because they get special, they get special consideration on tuition and everything when they go there. Look at Edgewood, they hardly ever lose their goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they don't have those opportunities in like the middle schools and the elementary schools. No. And well, they do have. Yeah. Right? They, yeah. they do have right. the middle school too. There. It's going to be a battle. Yeah. Which so, we lose. So, yes. Um, I'd just like to preface my remarks by saying that all of these issues are not 30 second sound bites. No. They're very complex issues. Absolutely. And for citizens or for legislators to approach them as simplistic issues that have quick fixes, this is a multi generational sea change that's going to have to occur yep. in order to turn around so right. the imbalance mm -hmm. that we see. I went to a private school in uh, Chicken Heights, Ohio, which at that time had one of the two or three best public schools systems in the nation. Mm -hmm. I went to a private school where I could have gone to that public school because my parents wanted me to have the very best education possible. That school, private school, is now charging $30,000 a year for middle school tuition, mm -hmm. over twenty-five dollars for lower school tuition, and um, over thirty-five dollars for upper school tuition. And it's just a tiny fraction of the assets of this private school. This is where the ultra-wealthy live. But most people in Wisconsin, I have found, it's been my uh, experience, that most people can't fathom that kind of wealth. They just completed a $125 million uh, uh, fundraising campaign that took two years. And now they're doing another one in the next two years. These people have untold amounts of money. And for legislators in Wisconsin to be supporting the uh, idea of giving people who have that kind of money, you talked about 77,000. Um, some of these people, uh, th th their wealth is beyond description. And those kinds of private schools in Wisconsin don't have voucher school students. They don't want them. Okay. So my question, specifically, is um, how does the uh, legislature uh, justify ethically uh, casting a kid in a almost depraved Milwaukee uh, living room? in the same light, with the same requirements. In other words, why are we not approaching, as we should, children as individuals, school districts as unique in their characteristics, rather than um, saying, well, it's a manufacturing environment and we're going to manufacture educated uh, citizens. It's, it's just not that simple, which goes back to my original. 
we, it seems like the legislature is making ridiculously simplistic and uh, distorted um, educational decisions mm -hmm. without um, fully understanding the implications of those uh, to society. They they understand it perfectly and yeah. doing. I mean, you get the best. If someone gives me a thousand dollars, I do what they want. Yeah. Right. What, what are the what are the lady from Texas say? So you dance with them that brought you. The question then becomes: Why isn't the citizenry appreciating this and understanding it? And why are they re-electing these legislators? Or are, is the citizenry too caught up in the Kardashians to be able to <laughs> grasp this? Right, right. But right now, if I asked you to put your papers down and close your eyes, and I gave you a test on this, how well would you do on 2R charters, charters, instrumentalities, virtuals? You know, it's, it's a darn hard thing to understand what has happened to public education, because most of us came to it with public Privates, I mean, there's homeschool over there, we don't know anything about them. And that was sort of the extent of it, and everything went well. But that stopped happening a number of years ago. And I, I am with you. I don't know how these people sleep at night. Excuse me. I really don't. Yes. But all this has happened before. This happened before the Great Depression, happened before the Civil War, happened before the Revolution. There's nothing new here. So the goal is the, the, this is going to blow up. Greed cannot stop. It's just it's nature. Mm -hmm. So when it blows up, are are there places in place to try to reset this? For instance, okay, the Patriot Act got passed because the Pat crisis. They pulled the same off thing and passed it overnight. Here it is. But someone Except wrote that. Triangle. Yeah, there are people. Really, but, but someone yeah. spent many years writing that document. Is someone spending time now trying to write how they would reset the schools? Because that's it's not going to go away. It's it's written. But they could reset. They could reset the legislation to authorize these when the next. You know the next explosion is coming. The London Financial Times and others say it's going to be summer 2016. That follows all the records we follow the boom and bust cycle of the last 30 years. And when it comes, everybody says it's going to be a big one. And that's the time to reset. This election, are, are there rules when they reset? But that's who, who resets and resets to what? Marys. Did you see what happened after Katrina? Right. The entirety of yeah. New Orleans became a charter school district. Well, they 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 for profit out. charter school district, which is failing miserably, by the way. I get it. So if the, if the economy crashes like it did in the Depression, right, then everything started resetting over a matter of a few years. Mm -hmm. And laws changed and reverted back to before. And so, right now, are there ways? Is the Democratic Party working on ways to break these ties? It's sitting on a shelf, so when the opportunity comes, they can pull these out. So is that plan being worked out by anybody? Are you talking about a new plan or, or going back to where we came from when it worked? Well, I don't know if you're going uh, back. The answer is no. I don't know. And I'm part of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, and I don't know that there is such a thing as you're describing it. And maybe we ought to be thinking about that. Um, yes? Well, the whole purpose here is the education of the children. What do we know about the results that are coming forth from all these different schools as far as the kids' education? What we know, and we know this because they have to take some tests and we have to see the test results. Even though they get to send those kids that don't do their tests very well home because they get to opt out and public schools don't. But we know that they sometimes do as well, they do not do better. And that's been the thing I have been saying loudest, is show me the evidence that a voucher school is going to do a better job of teaching, and there is none. And, and they even stopped the pretense of it's going to be better. That, they gave that up a while ago. Now it's just about money. It's just about money. Yes? Um, I spent six years as a consultant in Milwaukee, the central city, working with voucher schools. And I want to underline something you said. 
Safety. Safety is one of the major issues that is driving these schools or options. Jared C. Bruce Academy, I worked with on West Center Avenue, 15,000 convicted felons lived in the three zip codes around that school. When those kids walked out that door, they walked into chaos. And those parents or grandparents or guardians were desperate for safety. And one school I worked with, a kid showed a knife in class. They didn't expel the kid, and within two weeks, 50% of the teachers are gone, and 70% of the students are gone. Safety. They went home and said they had a knife in class. And that was enough to empty the school like that. Safety, I'm just saying what you're if, said. If Safety children, is crucial, and it's going to be crucial around here, too. If children and their education was the priority of this administration, we would be doing things far differently than we are. We would be addressing the poverty issue. And George, you had a question. Oh. Actually, a couple of comments. One is, is that actually this stuff has been planned by various groups, starting with the University of Chicago in the 1970s, early 80s. And templates have been developed. I mean, there was a Verona school election, I think, in 91 or 92, where the school board election went from basically candidates handing out mimeograph sheets to one complete slate of candidates handing out entire books printed in Pennsylvania. And so none of this is chance. A lot of this is a national strategy. It's basically developed very sophisticated. What struck me most interesting about this, though, in the presentation is on vouchers, is that there is another voucher program that basically covers children mostly up to about age five. It's child care and early childhood education, mainly for low-income people. The way it's run is almost entirely different. You have a very low eligibility scale. You have a single eligibility scale for the whole state, which means that it works very well in low-income rural communities doesn't work in high-cost urban communities because people basically can't get into it. Or they get into it and they, they get a raise, and instead of being able to continue, they'll get like a 10-cent raise and suddenly find themselves losing their voucher and then losing their ability to go to work. And so what's interesting is sort of how different it is. Uh, this one being very favored but also is, I think, pretty much designed to cut education costs. The other one being not very favored and being, and, and being cut by not getting the kids' services at all. But it's an, it's a, the formula is the way it operates is almost exactly different. Uh, and the other one is finally getting some standards, which is nice. <laughs> I don't know. It took us 20 years to get standards. I, I want to go back to, to a couple of things that we haven't talked about. Um, I don't know if you paid attention to what was going on this year, but the first bill that came to the Education Committee was Jeremy Fee's Bill 81, and it was creating a charter authorizing board for Milwaukee. And that thing exploded. We had people packed in the halls and in the overflow rooms. It was a total disaster. It didn't happen. They pulled it out. But the purpose of the Charter Authorizing Board was to be an appointed board by the governor who essentially would say, yes, uh, rocket ship, you can come into my city and you can start a charter school and you can use taxpayer dollars and you can do whatever you please, thank you very much. And they would do that until there was no more money to be made, but they found that it was just too difficult and they would pull up stakes and do something else. Money making private charter authorizing board. Failed miserably, but it will come back. The other thing I have not mentioned is that it has been introduced before and it's now been folded quietly into the budget in the omnibus bill, and that is a special needs voucher school. And that voucher school will be taking about $13,000 per kid. And 
because they are private, a non-communicative kid in a wheelchair can go in the front door of that building. Your $13,000 follows him or her, and we have zero control over what happens once they're in that building. We do not know, we have no say, no rules, nothing. It's all dependent on what that, that uh, special needs voucher school chooses to do. Yes? I think it's important for us who think of ourselves as progressives not to be conservatives when it comes to the issue of education. And by that I mean, while I am not in favor of radical, untested schemes uh, and not experimentation with the lives and the developmental years of our young people, I do think that it is important to learn where we have had some successes. And I do think it's important to take it uh, in a step-by-step -step way to proliferate those successes uh, if they, if, if people in those communities want those successes to proceed. We should be vigilant and proactive to discard any systems of education that we don't find to be uh, achieving the results that we want to achieve. We certainly have the testing facilities to do that. The point of my statement is this. My daughter, who graduated in the top 3% of her class, was bored in, in school for the most part. She had some excellent teachers. She worked extremely hard. She usually did five to seven hours of homework a night, uh, and she worked on weekends. She was so self-motivated that she, I believe, could have learned better in a system of education that I proposed to the school board here. That was to have a combination public school surveillance and monitoring of her progress with an independent study at home. And while we know that computer screens are deleterious to uh, students' uh, eye coordination and uh, brain function, it is possible that a highly motivated student could learn better at home mm -hmm. for the most part. Still, with all of that monitoring and supervision uh, that would come from an affiliation with a set of teachers in a school district. To some so, degree, we have that. There, there are opportunities for us to be progressive with education right. and to change systems that clearly are not working in many locales. I think of rural districts as an example. There are people in rural districts who commute a long ways, as you say. It's a waste of their time for the most part. Um, I believe that those students might better be served and might become better educated citizens if they were afforded alternative opportunities. So we need to keep our, our, our minds open. Absolutely. There's plenty of room for reform and innovation if, if we can afford to do it, for one thing. Um, my daughter's boyfriend, when she was in high school, was a year behind her. She went off to Edgewood College and he was still in high school. He entered the University of Wisconsin as a junior because he took so many AP classes and was he, he had a few mentor teachers who helped him get courses through the university while he was still at high school. But, you know, five minutes away from the university campus, that works. It doesn't work so well out there in Shelbyburg and Benton and places like that. I want to add one comment here, because I have been affiliated with the Mount Hope School District in a couple of capacities. I have the highest esteem for the Mount Hope School District and its, its staff. My daughter was bored in a couple of classes. I don't mean, did not mean to imply that she was, in fact, she loved Mount Hope High School. But overall, there are opportunities for thinking outside the box of its classic public school. Agreed. And we should do we should be able we should be able to afford to do more of that. We really should. Um, I wanted to hit a few other things that we haven't covered. Yes, George, did you have something? I just wanted to ask part of the difference between vouchers and charters is that charters usually have a whole conceptualization. 
So in other words, what Phil was talking about, I mean, in Verona, you basically have a group of parents who said, we want this particular approach mm -hmm. to education. Mm -hmm. They proposed a charter. And so you basically have there a whole sense of, well, this is where it's different than the public schools. My sense of the voucher programs is, is that a lot of them don't work that way. That it's just, it's first off, it's based on parent choice. And as we all know, what we don't like to talk about is the percentage of school failure is because of home environments. Right. So, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting. We're testing people for drugs for unemployment comp, but we aren't testing them, and we're giving them $7,800 vouchers. <laughs> but part of that, so part of that whole thing is that it's just a parent's choice, is depending on what it is. And it's not necessarily based on a matching of, we got this group of kids, they have a specific type of need. You know, the special, this doesn't sound like the special needs voucher is based on, okay, we're going to have this program that's going to be designed for special needs kids. It's just going to be, you've got thirteen or $15,000 that you can spend Now, that on some conversation place may go on between the parents and the operator. I don't know, because we have no knowledge of it. We're not part of it. We, the taxpayer, the well, department of But also you do a lot of designing. I mean, the same thing happens in child care. You do, there's a lot of people who come in for-profit child care who design very flashy buildings, and then when you look at their licensing violations or their overall evaluation based on violations, they're quite high. And so you do the same thing in any type of free market. If you're doing a voucher school, you can make it look very nice to the parent who's going there. And what he was talking about is right. The first thing is, is it's safer because the kid's not in public school and they're doing some screening. Uh, but the fact is, is that there's no real sense of the fact you got this curriculum or something designed for a specific group of kids with a specific group of needs. Some important things I need to tell you and have failed to do it. Right now, if you have a student going to a voucher school, the state of Wisconsin is paying $7,210 per kid K through 8. You, you, the taxpayer, are ponying up $7,856 for the high school student where that comes off the top again. That's guaranteed money. No matter how many kids there are, that's the dollar amount that's going with them. What's left is what gets divided up for your public school students. If they are going to the charter school, to our charter, non-instrumentality charter school, those kids are getting $8,075 guaranteed off the top. $8,075. Well, guess what has happened? The voucher people who are getting 7,000 are looking hungrily at the charter kids who are getting 8,000, and they are beginning efforts to convert their vouchers to charters in order to garner more money. So you're going to see more crossover in that area. Um, and somebody else mentioned the word licensing. Have you seen the noise about licensing today? Yeah. So we are going to be the only state in the United States of America who allows teachers to teach in our public schools with nothing more than a bachelor's degree. If there's they, not they don't need that in all content areas. No, no not in all content areas, but with just a bachelor's degree, the state of Wisconsin will let you teach. Tell me cronyism isn't going to happen here. That the guy who decides you are going to teach in my school can't be handing out fancy little teaching licenses to friends, supporters, blah, blah, blah. The thing that drives me the crazy about, craziest about this and I have said it since I walked into the legislature. Follow the money. It's always about the money. It's right. always, always, always about the money. Excuse me. Could I ask you one question? Sure. Try to change subjects. Racine, the budget's going to knock out the Racine School District and and the school board. Why the school board? That's a whole. Different. But is that something school state wide? Is it the best case in Racine that they will go to other school districts and wipe out the school board? It's, it's very possible. I, I, I think school board members ought to be very concerned. Your powers are being taken away from you left and right. So you're seeing that basically they basically fired the whole school board and the whole special election, right? To elect a school board 
but they redistrict it, right, to get the election a certain way. <laughs> so can that now happen in, let's say, Mount Horror School District? I won't go so far as to say that, but what I will tell you is, you know how the ALEC organization has orchestrated? Okay. They are coming to school boards near you. They are coming to town boards. They are coming to places where you've got something that they want to make money. And all they have to do is set up the governance in their favor. And it's happening. County boards, look what's happened to the county board in Dane County. That the state of Wisconsin says they can't have the powers that they are supposed to. The only, the only county in Wisconsin that can't control, that has no control of their water control. Because the developers want to do things in Dane County that the county people, the electorate wouldn't let them do, so let's just wipe out their power. Does the concern of corruption come to mind? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to take more questions, but I, I want to be sure I get this piece in before some of you start wandering off, because I would if I were you. Um, <laughs> I am powerless to make a change. There are 36 Democrats sitting in the assembly. Out of 99, there are 36 of us. There isn't a damn thing that I can do to change any vote in that room. I know whatever they want to do, they will do. Almost the same situation over in the Senate. Very, very slim chance that things won't go the way they want them to go. We know what the governor's going to do. Sign the bill and release. Yes, yes, yes. Let it in on that. Still think it's still thinking. Maybe they ought to bite the bullet and keep them here as a governor. So what I'm saying is, yes, I'm duly elected to represent you. And I go down there and I complain and I screech until my lungs are hanging out on my shoes. And I, I shine lights on, on the wrongness of it all. I can't make it stop. Do you know where it stops? It stops in the ballot box. And when I talk to kids in school, especially in high school, I find out how many of them are soon to become voters, and I remind them, the largest demographic in the state, in the United States of America, is the 18 to 24 year old, and bless their hearts, they don't go vote. So they're going to do what the old white men want them to do. And until they wake up and realize, you know what, this country would be run by the people we want, doing the things we think are best, all we have to do is go vote. And with redistricting, we're stuck where we are for a good long time. That's not going to change. Yes? Um, I have a question about the religious school, uh, component in our uh, publicly funded schools. Mm -hmm. um, it is my understanding that if a student does not want to participate in the religious activities of a religiously affiliated school, he or she does not have to do that. That's correct. Okay. So, if someone is uh, going under a voucher or some other funding mechanism to a religious school, um, it is that student's or that parent's of that student's option to exclude or remove that child from mm -hmm. that environment. Mm -hmm. That ameliorates the situation a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. um, that way, that student can pursue the quality of education sure. in that school sure. without the religious indoctrination. And there are some stellar, stellar parochial schools in the state of Wisconsin that are doing fabulous work. I, I don't mean to you know, denigrate anything there. I just happen to know that you know, um, Alex Academy of Excellence, spelled incorrectly, was thrown <laughs> together. It was. It was thrown together by some Right here. Evangelical kind of family that said, "Hey, we can make money be in school. We don't have to. We don't have to do a whole lot. Let's just take the money." And that happened a lot, just a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and we it took us years to get some control over it. And we still don't have control over it. Yes. We go over. Let me make sure that I understand the funding formula right. <laughs> People understand it. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that anyone does, because it's hard, it's really complicated. But even as a simplified matter, I think there's often a misconception, like in Bing County, there's like 17 voucher kids or 18 voucher kids. That's not what comes off of the Dane County schools. 
what comes off of the Dane County School amount that you have for the kid over all the state is all the voucher kids at the top. And all the charter kids. So it's not a case of the fact that you have a failing school system and so bad, bad on you and those kids go into voucher schools and you lose the money. The fact is the money comes off totally statewide. The other interesting aspect of this is that you have one rate or two rates that you're talking about. Or, you, know, you have specifically a statewide rate for voucher schools, but your own school district may have less or more than that because of the fact that the actual school tax formula is quite complex and it drops as development occurs. So it's a ratio between property valuation and the number of kids in the district. So if you're in a district like Verona, one of the things Verona quite often struggled with was as they built buildings, they actually lost state money. Mm -hmm. And so you can very easily get into a situation where, one, the amount of money you're in already is dropping. Two, it drops more because your share overall drops, and the voucher kids are coming off the top. And the charters. And the charter kids. So I mean, that's something to, well, the, the non-public charter as opposed to the charter right, kids. Right. <laughs> so the, the two are charter. Yeah. So I mean I think that's something that people need to realize because what people think about is that this is something that's happening over there. And budget wise it's happening here. And you're quite often and you may very well if you actually looked at your budget on a per kid basis because budgets are real complicated because you look at what you get from the state, but some of that's federal money. You may actually look at the fact that you might be getting less state money back than is going out to another part of the state. Well, and don't forget, too, that this gang of thieves who have all pledged to not raise any tax ever, 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 <laughs> um, and signed the pledge, you know, as they're proud of themselves, they won't even let you raise your own tax. So if things go to heck and you really need more money, you are not allowed to increase your you know, the revenue. It's, it's a very complicated process, but they are purposely, purposely starving public education so that they can turn around and say, it's failing, we need to hand it over to for-profit charters because they're coming, they're sitting out there in Kentucky and all around Wisconsin going, okay, the opportunities are here. They're going to be coming in and they will be for-profit charters, not the kind of charter that you're accustomed to in Verona, or the at-risk charters that I was talking about earlier, but for-profit charter business that is coming to Wisconsin to make money on our students. And how do we stop them? How do we yeah, stop them? The other factor on that is people think, oh, it's $10,000 per kid in my school district, but a bunch of that's their property taxes. That's right. And so what the voucher kids quite often are getting is a higher rate. Can you speak, do you know anything about the proposal to take over the Milwaukee Public Schools as kind of a backdoor into taking control of the Wisconsin retirement system? Or is that just another, yeah, is that just another rumor? Or is there no, another it's not another rumor. It's certainly something they're talking about. And trust me, there is nothing that this group proposes that I don't believe is Is that real. the same thing with the new receipt? Is this going to go off the board and take it over? Or is it a different idea? It's a different idea. <laughs> so, I guess my message to you is that this is a complicated mess. We are losing control over public education at the expense of our kids. And the bottom line, the bottom line, the change will come from the ballot box because there's no stopping this. The Walmart people, the, the Amway people, the, those high, highly paid lobbyists who walk around the Capitol. I, I ran into Jim Bender this morning after we did a press conference on an issue very similar to this one. And he just smiled at me and said, I didn't make it to the press conference. And I said, yeah, sorry, I just really missed you too. Um, <laughs> he's, he just walks straight into boss's office. He's got everything he wants because he buys the campaigns. Every one of them is a Somebody needs to tell me why Howard Markline, sen Senator from Spring Green, was Vice President of the Education Committee and one of the strongest proponents for voucher schools in our state. 
Why? While putting in the 1% rule, which saves his district from having it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, if it last... wasn't to, to fund his campaign for the Senate against um, Dale Schultz, because he was going to threaten to primary him if Dale didn't resign. If it wasn't for that purpose, I need to know why, because there's nothing there except that. Follow the money. Anyway, so I hope I haven't depressed you horribly. <laughs> Appropriately. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, you know, I, I, I have to temper my husband sometimes because he's just awful, awful, awful. You really do have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to stop being nice to the people that don't understand, the people who disagree with you. You have to become more vocal. You have to insist that they don't understand what they're talking about. It is time for crisis. It really is. And my husband can't help himself. He talks to his dad in Florida, and they fight politics. He talks to his brother up in Black River Falls, and they fight politics. He goes to help a friend put up a fence, and they fight politics. <laughs> <laughs> So he's taken my advice to heart, and I need to kind of temper him a little bit. But we really do. We have to stop being nice to people and start being yeah. really honest about this has to change while we still have the chance. It's sort of like climate change. At some point, it slipped between our fingers and it's gone. You know? Yeah, what does That's what it is. Couple last questions. And then well, this is saying, and Sandy, I, I just admire so much how you and everybody else the Democratic Party gets up day after day and does this for us. The other thing is that I, um, I'm in the Barona District and I um, post on Facebook, we have a group of educators plus my own, you know, uh, friends, whatever. I post this swap stuff uh, all the time and I posted this multiple times. And I got a comment from a teacher. I have no idea how he's a friend, you know. Uh, in one of these districts, we seem to be specific. He said, see if Sandy will take this on the road. I have some money to help her. <laughs> uh, this, I call this my dog and pony show. Well, it has been I mean, one of the biggest groups I did in front was in Waukesha. Okay. Sixty people in the room. Yeah. Oh, That's the territory you tread lightly. In. This is your email from Racine, who I have no idea. I of course, I've never met or heard of a union meeting or anything. Uh, this is all, what all I have to have so, is enough space to do some writing. Well, I don't know if you, if, uh, but I just wanted to pass that on to yeah. you. Absolutely. That. Yep. Because it's one of the few things he says. We need to get the word out to the people who need to know. Well, and this subject is really confusing. Yeah. And it's very, very easy to just go, oh, God, I don't understand that, and stop thinking about it. And you haven't even gotten into the confusing No. Stuff. <laughs> we really haven't. We really haven't. Yes. My question is, is voucher money going to the private schools? Yes. 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 By how, many, how do they qualify? Just, A private school? They just do it. It's on an individual yeah. basis or whatever. You mean how does the student apply to the... No, I'm talking about the private religious schools that are like here. In the statewide program, there is an application process. We only took 25 the first time around. Okay. And, yeah. Um, but, you know, that's the camp so there are, they, intent. they apply as individual schools for the voucher program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's keep in mind, serious. every two years this thing changes sure. and it gets bigger and worse. And worse. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. So whatever constraints we have today, don't count on them being there later. Do we get both the voucher and the tax deduction? Oh, here's the good piece. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. <laughs> if my private school charges a, let's say, $4,000 tuition for a high school student, the state of Wisconsin sends them that full 7000 whatever, regardless. We don't sell them what it costs other people to be in. We send them that same amount. So that's just gravy. Just gravy. Yeah. I see why they're trying to get into it. Well, sure. It's a good deal. Okay. Well, it was lovely talking with you. And yes, I'd be happy to take my little dog and pony show anywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.